the intent of this portion of the module for helicopter operations safety is to improve our safety with working with helicopters. And the way we're going to do that, um, by, the way we're going to improve safety is by limiting exposure. And how we limit exposure is by improving the efficiency of working with helicopters. And how do you improve efficiency is through better communications, both through verbal and visual, and giving good, honest feedback um, with the pilot. The whole communications process is for them to communicate to me what they want. Because I don't want to haul, buck, haul a bucket of water maybe five miles and not put it where they want it. Working with helicopters, you're exposed to many hazards as a firefighter. Some you can control and some you can't. And the ones that you can control can be mitigated or dramatically reduced by practicing good situational awareness and proactive communications. The firefighter, when working with helicopters, is asking the helicopter to perform in a place of its performance where it's, it's slow speed and low altitude, which doesn't allow it um, the ability to recover in the event of a loss of power. So the least amount of time you want to ask the pilot to be in that, what we call the dead man's curve, the less exposure that pilot has. And then the less time you're underneath it, at any point in time, if something happens, um, it can come down directly upon you. So you want to just go ahead and make that mission as um, brief and efficient as possible. Whether you're calling in the drop or whether you're just a, a firefighter standing by, it's real important to consider your location in relation to what's above you. If the helicopter's coming in for a drop, you need to realize, you know, the rotor wash itself or the drop from the bucket or the water can dis dislodge debris and throw it upon you. Medium and heavy hollow tankers can drop, you know, anywhere from 300 to 2,000 gallons at once, and that's a great deal of weight. You know, a gallon of water is 8.3 pounds times 2,000. You do the math, that's a lot of weight coming down at once. So you really need to be taking consideration where you're at and consider your escape route to move out of the area clearly. Before you launch, you, you definitely need to take into consideration is this the right, the right tool for the objective that you're hoping to achieve on the fire? What is your tactical objective? Communicating your tactical objectives when you place an order is really important if you're on a large fire to communicate that to the air attack or if it's an initial attack situation to communicate that to the, to the manager of the crew coming in, how are you going to use that helicopter and then also have a backup plan. If, if it comes in and gets a chip light or another priority comes up that you have some other way of meeting your tactical objective not relying on the, on the aviation resource. Some uh, firefighters out there do try and, and, and explain their you know, tactical objective to the pilots and some, some firefighters just make an assumption that the pilot's been here, he's done that, he knows what, he, you know, what they want done and, and they're making the assumption the manager is going to do that with the pilot. But really the ownership is placed on the IC to explain exactly what it is that you're trying to do on the fire. If it's a smaller fire, sometimes you can anticipate, you know, we may only need you for a few buckets and then we'll release you. It's just another tool. It's like a, you know, a Pulaski or a shovel or a chainsaw that you're using on the fire. It's a way to put the fire out. And when you're done with it, you need to just put it down. As a pilot's coming in, if he doesn't know your location, you definitely want to um, consider the aircraft as a clock, you know, with the nose being 12 and the tail of it being 6, and out the right door to the side will be uh, 3, and then out the left will be 9. And as you're coming in, you, you explain your position in relation to them. You know, I'm at your 12 o'clock low, or I'm at your, you know, 1 o'clock high, whatever it is, if it's coming in low or high. Go ahead. Yeah, at this time I'm going to use you for a spot drop. Um, I'm at your uh, 1 o'clock right now. 12 o'clock low. I got a panel set up. I have your panel. Yeah, if I could get a spot drop on this panel, that'd be great. Copy, spot on the panel. And you're all clear. Once they have you in position, um, then you can explain, you know, your position in relation to the parts of the fire, whether it be the heel or the left flank or right flank or the head of the fire. And um, I would ask people to refrain from using the cardinal directions, such as north, south, east, or west. Cardinal directions are really tough because, especially if I'm hanging out the window and I'm turning around, I'm looking for you, I'm not paying very much attention to which direction is south, which direction is west. 
think about what it is you're going to say before you push the button on a radio. And that goes with any fire communications. Don't just key the radio and start thinking. Think about what you're going to say first. Think about phrasing it in the shortest possible means and then key the radio and say what it is you're going to say. And when you're done, you know, let other people talk. Consider what it is that the pilot is doing inside the aircraft when he's bringing a, a long line um, load to you or, or a bucket drop to you because um, he's manipulating the aircraft in its highest performance curve. He's, he's operating it at low altitude and at slow forward airspeed and he's having to avoid all the hazards and he's very busy looking out the window trying to keep uh, you safe and trying to keep the load safe. So if you call him and he doesn't answer, he's busy. So just realize he'll be getting back to you um, and not be uh, impatient when you're talking to him. Feedback is real important to the pilot. Good shot, 6-5, go ahead and uh, come on back. You need to, um, to communicate, you know, was the drop accurate? Was it too early? Was it late? And, and getting that, giving that honest feedback directly to the pilot. And they can also communicate to you your directions, you know, maybe your directions weren't very efficient or, or, you know, lack some clarity and, you know, clearing up that communication will make the second or third drop more efficient and reduce the exposure time. When you've ordered an aircraft to support you on a fire, you want to designate a competent firefighter that understands how to communicate clearly and concisely and briefly to the pilot and you want to make sure that um, if you're expecting aircraft that you're monitoring that frequency and you're not scanning other channels that can override the priority of the traffic coming through so that, that there's very little hang time in the air for the pilot to try and, and get hold of people. The consequences of a pilot not being able to contact a ground contact is it forces the pilot to burn circles in the air in, in trying to make contact with the ground person. Um, and if they, if they just can't, they're not going to start doing um, any work on that fire until they can. It's a waste of time, it's inefficient, and flight time is expensive, um, and it's just putting everybody at a greater risk. The worst situation is when I get all the way over there, still haven't got a hold of anybody, and I'm just flying around with a bucket load of water, and they're not hermetically sealed. I mean, there's water leaking out, and you're flying around burning up flight time. It is important to, to understand that the resource that you're working with, the helicopter and crew that's coming in may not be from your area and don't make any assumptions that they know the local landmarks or the local vegetation types or the local fire behavior and how it will be affected by the vegetation that's burning into and try and keep that in mind um, as you're asking specifics of the pilot. It's entirely appropriate to ask the pilot, how is it you want me to call in the drop? Do you want me to show you a panel and put it exactly on the drop where I want it? Um, what is the best way for us to communicate and then work this out? The pilot's coming in before they've ever landed or set up for the bucket work. You say, I'm at the heel of the fire. Do you understand where that's at? Do you have the heel of the fire? And they'll say, yeah. And then do you have the head of the fire and the larger fires? It'll be pretty obvious, you know, where the, the area of the most intense heat is. You say, all right, you understand the left flank, right flank, this is how we got it going, set up, and, and then once you have that common ground established, that's the best part. The perspective from the air is much different than the perspective of the ground, and don't assume that the pilot knows exactly what you're seeing. Um, topography looks different, fire size looks different, people are hard to see and hard to locate, so really take into consideration and, and what it is you're explaining for the drop or the mission. As a ground firefighter, when you're working on a slope, such as a 30% slope, to you it might appear moderately steep, and a lot of times the directions are given as I want the next drop directly up slope of that. Um, from a pilot's perspective, the topography isn't as obvious. From his angle of flight, um, the 30% slope might look totally different to him, and it might appear more flat, and it's, it's more difficult for him to understand what upslope and downslope is. So it's helpful to be a little bit more specific on how it is you want the drop. Okay, we're clear. Okay, I can't tell where the ridge is up the ridge from here. What direction is that? Okay, um, I need a visual on the ground. Where's north? Along the tree line. Oh. 
it is important to identify yourself if you're calling in the drop to the pilot so they can uh, you know understand their perspective from what you want from what they're seeing and a way to do that is um, if you feel comfortable and you're not concerned with the overhead hazards you can take off your hard hat and wave it see if they see you or if you have a piece of high visibility orange paneling you can wave that they tend to see that pretty clearly and if not, you can take a bunch of pieces of, of orange or pink flagging, tie it on the end of a tool, and wave your tool back and forth until they establish that they have seen you. Mirror flashes are, are wonderful. Okay, good mirror flash. I have you in sight. And just make sure you communicate to the crew. Only you are going to identify yourself and, and not everybody. If you are choosing to use a trainee, make sure you have a competent person with them, initially establishing communications, and then maybe allow the trainee to um, to have some opportunities as the drop is being called in a little bit later. The way we're going to improve safety is by limiting exposure. And how we limit exposure is by improving the efficiency of working with helicopters. And how do you improve efficiency is through better communications, both through verbal and visual, and giving good, honest feedback um, with the pilot. Hello, I'd like to talk to you for the next few minutes about helicopter capabilities and limitations, things the helicopter can and cannot do. These are very important for you to know as the passenger. Subjects we'll cover will be the flight controls, we'll touch on aerodynamics, hovering in and out of ground effect, emergency procedures, weight and balance, and of course density altitude. Come on aboard. There are four primary flight controls. The first is the cyclic, flown with the right hand. The second is the collective on the left side of the pilot. This one includes the throttle on this particular model. And down below we have the anti-torque pedals. Through manipulating of these controls, the pilot is able to fly the helicopter. When the pilot moves the cyclic forward, this tilts the rotor disc the same direction. This redirects lift and thrust, moving the helicopter forward. As the cyclic is moved backward, the rotor disc tilts to the rear, and the helicopter moves backward. The same is true for movement to the left and to the right. The collective at the pilot's left side controls the up and down movement of the helicopter. As the collective is raised, the pitch of the main rotor blades is increased collectively. 
more lift is generated and the helicopter goes up. When the pilot lowers the collective, lift is reduced, so the helicopter descends. The throttle is also located on the collective. In turbine helicopters, the pilot uses this during startup and shutdown of the engine. A governor controls proper engine RPM during flight. At the pilot's feet are the anti-torque pedals. These control the thrust of the tail rotor. The tail rotor counteracts torque created by the main rotor and keeps the helicopter from spinning. The anti-torque pedals also provide directional control, left and right, when the helicopter is in a stable hover. When the pilot pushes the left pedal, the helicopter rotates to the left. The right pedal causes a turn to the right. Now let's talk about helicopter performance. A condition called ground effect generally improves the capabilities of helicopters. Simply put, when a helicopter is within one half rotor diameter from the ground, it is called hovering in ground effect, HIGI. A cushion of air has been created between the ground and the helicopter, increasing lift and reducing power requirements, providing the surface is relatively smooth and level. Rough terrain, ridge tops, or pinnacles may reduce or even eliminate the advantages of ground effect. Once the helicopter exceeds the one half rotor diameter distance above the ground, the cushion of air dissipates and you are now hovering out of ground effect, hoagy. To maintain a hover, the helicopter must now use considerably more power, reducing its effective payload. As you can see, the helicopter is much more efficient when you can use in-ground effect sites for your takeoffs and landings. And if you must use an out-of-ground effect site, the number of people or pounds of cargo you want to carry may have to be reduced drastically. A normal takeoff consists of bringing the helicopter up to an in-ground effect hover and translating the helicopter into forward flight. Additional lift is created as the helicopter moves from the turbulent air created from hovering to undisturbed or clean air in forward flight. This is called translational lift. Translational lift occurs at about 15 to 18 miles per hour. Translational lift will also be produced when hovering with a 15 or more mile per hour steady headwind. The wind blows the turbulent air away and provides clean air and more lift for the helicopter. This is why pilots prefer to take off and land into the wind. When the helicopter must hover out of ground effect, hoagie, to enter or leave a confined area, or to clear a tall obstacle without the benefit of translational lift, this is called a maximum performance takeoff or landing. During this maneuver, the helicopter is totally power dependent and margins of safety are reduced. So whenever possible, try and avoid these types of landing areas. What are the helicopter's capabilities in the event of an emergency? An engine failure, for instance? Engine failures in turbine helicopters are very rare. However, should one occur, a helicopter is capable of auto rotation to a safe landing. A good thing to know if you're a passenger. During powered flight, air flows through the rotor system from the top and out the bottom. Helicopters have a free wheeling unit which automatically allows the main rotor to rotate freely if the engine fails or there is some other mechanical emergency. The rotor system then maintains flight RPM by reversed airflow. The pilot has full control of the helicopter during this maneuver, as they will now demonstrate for you in this practice auto rotation. Here, I have completely lowered the collective and removed all power 
to the rotor system. The helicopter descends rapidly at this point. As I approach the landing site, I ease back on the cyclic, raise the helicopter's nose, and slow the forward airspeed and rate of descent. Now, I level the helicopter, and using the stored up inertia in the rotor blades, I cushion it to the ground, completing the auto rotation. Each helicopter model has a chart called the height velocity diagram. This chart shows the combination of airspeed and altitude from which a safe auto rotation can be made. As you can see, the safest flying is done above 500 feet and at cruise airspeed. This is not to say, do not go low and slow. Just limit your flying in this area to only that that is necessary to get your job done. Remember to assume the emergency position during any auto rotation from any height. Now let's talk about density altitude and its effect on aircraft performance. Density altitude by definition is pressure altitude or elevation corrected for temperature and humidity. Air is said to be thin at higher elevations. That is, there are fewer air molecules per cubic foot at 10,000 feet than there are at sea level. Also, as air is heated, it expands and you can get fewer molecules of warm air in one cubic foot than you can cool air. In effect, warm air is also thin. So, as you go up in altitude and temperature, density altitude also goes up. At lower density altitudes, such as sea level on a cool day, the rotor blades are moving through dense air, creating maximum lift at lower power settings. When the density altitude goes up, the air thins out, the rotor blades have less air to grab, and the pilot must increase power. Helicopter performance and capabilities decrease. So, during the warm summer months, plan your helicopter projects for early morning when the air is cool to maximize the performance of your helicopter. And when you add hover out of ground effect landings, or HOGI, to your project, just remember the saying, when it's high, HOGI, and hot, you may not carry a heck of a lot. Finally, we need to discuss weight and balance. At any given altitude and temperature, by manufacturer specifications, a helicopter can only carry a certain amount of weight the pilot must determine this weight based on the current conditions by doing load calculation from his aircraft flight manual prior to the flight. This weight or payload must not be exceeded. Accurate weights of passengers and cargo are an absolute necessity for the pilot to properly load the helicopter. Once this allowable payload has been determined, the pilot must then balance it aboard the helicopter. If you draw an imaginary line through the helicopter, at the middle of the rotor system, this is what is known as the center of gravity, or CG. To maintain the best and safest flying characteristics, the pilot has to balance the load on the helicopter. If the CG is too far to the rear, or aft, the helicopter flies with a nose-up attitude. If the CG is too far forward, then the nose tilts down. In either case, control movements are difficult and maneuverability is decreased, not desirable if an emergency should occur. The same is true for lateral CG or side-to-side -side loading. Try to keep all weight evenly distributed. If in doubt, ask the pilot where to sit or place and secure all cargo. I hope this program has helped you understand a helicopter's capabilities and limitations and that you can use this knowledge in your future use of helicopters. Stay alert and enjoy your flying.